Okay, this video is for the English 104 class that normally meets on Tuesday, Thursday from 9.35 to 11. And what I'm going to do is continue our introduction um, to Lao Tse. And I'm going to cover about the first eight chapters or so of um, Lao Tse. Um, <clears throat> so this is for you guys um, because we will not be meeting on Tuesday, okay? Um, where, where I'll be is I'll be at a doctor's appointment, so I apologize I'm going to not be there. This is instead, um, in a video lesson, what, we're, what we essentially would have been covering. Um, the good news, so the bad news is I won't be there. Everybody, uh, I'm so sad, the teacher won't be there. Um, <clears throat> the good news is this is only going to take 10, 15, 20 more minutes for me to talk myself blue. Um, so once I'm done talking about this and setting up Lao Tse, you've got Lao Tse down, okay? Um, so you don't need to go to class. You don't need to be there. Um, you're done for the day on Tuesday. Um, I also have an appointment, a doctor's appointment on Thursday. Um, please understand I would not cancel these classes if I could help it. I... Uh, so I wish I, I, I could keep them uh, in session. I tried to get a sub for me for Tuesday. I couldn't do it. I'm trying for Thursday. So please understand Tuesday is canceled. That's September 3rd. Tuesday, September 3rd is canceled. But um, Thursday, September 5th, I'm trying to get a subs to co uh, sub to cover for me if um, I can get a good um, Plato expert um, to go in to hold the class. If it's not going to be held, I will definitely send out another one of these delightful videos <clears throat> for Thursday, okay? So Thursday, it will either be a sub or another video. So Thursday the 5th um, will either be a sub or another video. So my apologies for not being there, but hey, cry it out and enjoy that you only have about a 20-minute video instead of an hour-and-a-half class, okay? So a little bit of review. Um, is just on ideology, okay? Um, remember that it's core values, and it's your core values regarding politics. Um, you know, the thing, one of the things I mentioned in class is, you know, if you voted for candidate B, but candidate A got slightly more votes, and but you would not want candidate B to take office, then you believe in democracy. That's your core value on politics, okay? So these aren't superficial values. These run more deeply, okay? Um, your values on how society should work, how we should treat each other. Um, your values, you know, and, and these run very deep on how you should be civil to each other, on whether or not there should be classes um, and hierarchies within classes we're going to talk about today um, and go a little bit further with this. Um, also on religion, it's not simple of, you know, hey, I'm Mormon and I want everybody. No, it's not that. And I'm agnostic and I want everybody. No, it, it's not that either. Um, it's, for example, most Americans or most folks in the 20th century would say, you know what? You believe what you want to believe and I'll, I'll respect that and I'll do what I want to do. And that's your view regarding, that's your ideology. In many countries and throughout history, um, many people would say, hey, this country is a Catholic country. You'd better be Catholic or off with your head. Um, or this country is, you know, this, this, or, you know, if I had to travel you guys all back in time and we went back um, to the 70s and we went to um, Cambodia, it was run by an agnostic, I mean, an uh, atheist government that, yeah, you can't have religion. So that was the approach towards religion. Um, <clears throat> your ideology runs deeper than where you go if you go to church on Sunday or if you don't or if you think you should, things like that. It runs deeper. It runs into your whole approach and how you would view other people. And, you know, I would urge you to have respect no matter what people have. Um, and then economics. We're going to go into that um, as we go through the semester. Um, do you believe in a society that's run according to this? Should people all be receiving the same amount of money? Um, should wealthy families be able to send their kids to wealthy colleges? Um, should everybody get into college? Um, should everybody have to pay for cars? And should you have to pay for roads? And things like that. It runs more deeply. Don't assume that what you've been handed is your ideology. It always runs deeper. 
And again, I'm, something I mentioned in class, you always start to re realize what your ideology is when you travel to other countries. Um, think of if you could travel to 500 years ago, um, how you'd be shocked probably by the different approaches to things. You would be shocked by the ideology, the value systems behind the way that people organize their minds and their approach and their expectations. That's what ideology is, okay? So it gets into the essential differences are between conservative and um, liberal and how I define them in class was humankind in, in conservative ideology is essentially um, irrational, selfish, destructive. It, it's that person sitting next to you, that guy's a threat, okay? He's a problem or she is. Um, they're gonna slash your tires. Um, yeah, it's not that ridiculous. If given an opportunity, they would probably do it, maybe. The conservative ideology is built on those implications. The liberal ideology is that people are essentially rational. That we can all sit here and we can discuss things and we can all get along, blah, blah, blah. Um, <clears throat> both of them are there, constantly in how you approach society and how you approach you know, a public space. Um, it's better with a liberal society if you let people um, determine their own course. And it's better in a conservative society if you guide them all or threaten them all or centralize the decision making. Okay, um, So both of them, almost everybody is in different circumstances, a different ideology is at work. Um, but you're going to find that whether or not you trust people to do certain things will determine whether or not you're liberal or conservative under these circumstances. It's not like I said, the way we assume it is, okay? Um, it's not so simple, but these run behind our approaches to political spaces and how we organize society, okay, and how we do this. Most people are essentially, not somewhere in between, but a combination. Um, these two ideologies are wrestling it out and working it out. That's fine, okay? So understand whether or not you trust people to run their own show under these circumstances and if they're doing a good job, are they doing it on their own or are they doing it just because they were told to do it? Um, that's how you see ideology playing out, okay? Um, so just know that, and that's going to come up in each of these readings. Um, and I'm going to go through that with Lao Tse today, <clears throat> okay? So the political science readings are good. We're going to do the four. This is kind of repeating last time. Lao Tse is around 500. Plato is around 400. They're... There's this kind of weird thing that happened around 500 years before um, you know, Christ was born. Um, we had all this philosophy that was developed. And Asia did it with Confucius was around this time. Um, and so was Lao Tse and Plato. And there was this weird flourishing of ideas and concepts that were going on throughout the world. We'll come back to that later. That, that, that's a, something that only interests people like who are boring like me. So that happened in Asia and in Greece. Um, and it, you know, there was a flourishing around 500 years ago. Um, then there's, we're going to jump to Niccolo Machiavelli, who is at um, the beginning of the Renaissance, the European Renaissance. He's writing in what would have been considered by English folks, um, people in England were still digging their way out of the medieval times. Um, he's writing in what would be known um, <clears throat> late 1490s as the early Italian Renaissance. And he's writing um, The Prince, which was his little book that he never published. It was a tiny little book, but it is, in my mind, the most influential political science book ever written. And even if you're not um, directly familiar with it, having read it, um, um, you would probably know it from um, Tupac Shakur's Machiavelli. Um, or you would know it because you would recognize things like it's better to be feared um, than to be loved. Those are all Machiavellian ideas. Um, we'll come back to that later on. That's going to be a, what I would consider the archetype of conservative ideology. Because he sees everything embodied in the figure of the prince. But you can disagree when we get there. Now, Mary Wollstonecraft isn't read as often today, but man, she was <laughs> good. Um, not only was she the mom of Mary Shelley, who would write Frankenstein, but she, yeah, she had married at the time um, a man who had written, uh, our, um, so anarchist philosophy at the time, what would be called today anarchist, that everything, all institutions are essentially corrupt. Um, and she essentially, Mary Wollstonecraft, essentially uh, ascribed to that same philosophy. Um, she did not see 
um, hierarchies or structures as being good for society, as those were in her mind um, corruptive. We're going to come back to that. She's a liberal, okay? So the way I'm going to approach this unit, and I, I'm, I am repeating a little bit from the first day of class, I am going, I am going to classify. You can do it differently. I'm going to put Lao Tse in the liberal camp, Plato in the conservative camp, and so I'm going to put Machiavelli there. They're going to sit down together and eat your lunch. Okay, um, and Lao Tse, you're sitting all alone. Well, here, you can sit down with Ma uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. I'll put those two on liberal and Plato and Machiavelli and conservative. I will do that. You can do it differently. Now, what I've found over the years is that students, they mostly, they, they kind of agree um, with how I do it, but they don't agree entirely on everything. That's perfectly fine. What I'm going to want you to do is treat the reading carefully, and I'm going to do that today with Lao Tse, and you're going to see you can take it. The very important thing is close reading. You can take it in more than one direction. I'm going to take it in those directions. Lao Tse is going to be liberal. Plato is going to be conservative, and you're going to see why. Um, I might or might not convince you, but you're going to see why somebody who's perfectly reasonable, hopefully that's me, um, can see Lao Tse as being liberal, but you might see him as being more conservative. And I should hopefully be able to see, by the time we get um, done with this, why you as a reasonable person see it either as liberal or conservative. But the important thing is that you are going to read carefully. Um, you're going to do what I encourage you to do, which is what I call, this is a big f fancy philosophical term, but time. Sit down with the reading and you're going to show me what's going on um, why you consider it to be liberal or conservative, okay? So let's jump in um, to the Lao Tse. Now, this is, you have a, a paper copy of it, and this is the, the reading. I've got a PDF right here. Um, the paper copy doesn't go in video. Let's not talk about that. I tried. It, it didn't fit. Um, a little bit of Lao Tse is said to be a contemporary of Confucius. Um, contemporary doesn't mean they hung out and had lunch together. They they didn't do that. They would they would have ended up at the Olive Garden anyway, so let's not talk about it. But they were around the same time. Okay, they were writing at the same time. And it's fascinating that Confucius um, was writing in one area, Lao Tse in another. Plato, it, it happened all at once. It, there was this flourishing of philosophy in the world. Um, we're not exactly sure why. Um, the Jewish, um, the original Jewish texts were starting to start up at this time what went on because it didn't happen you know 700 BCE um, and it had gotten kicked in around 500 it's really weird that it got going at this time um, now very important to keep in with my uh, mind with Lao Tse um, and this is something I, I did mention in the last class um, maybe one author with slight modifications maybe one author with many significant um, modifications and it may be a whole bunch of authors stuck together and put under the title of Lao Tse. We don't know. <clears throat> okay. Now, something I'm going to introduce you to later on is this notion of um, how they do um, textual criticism. Um, they will actually, and we'll bring this up as we go through it, but this is an ancient text. This is from 500 BCE. And the thing is, these things would have floated around and people would change them. You didn't have photocopiers um, to turn out the same copy again and again. You had people called, my name's Photo, and I copy. Um, and his name was actually Dougie, and he just writes things down. People wrote them down. And you wouldn't know it while I was writing it down if I added a few sentences that I thought were really cool that my Aunt Martha told me. Um, and I put it in Confucius. You wouldn't know that Aunt Martha actually wrote that. Okay. So what we have under the name of Lao Tse was copied over and over again. The original copies that we have are not from 500 or even 400 or even 300 to it. They're from around the year 89. Um, this is 500 years after Lao Tse was originally written. But I want to emphasize this. This was a point from class. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Um, with Plato, we will know that it's his work. With uh, Lao Tse, Da, um, I don't know. <clears throat> and I've read enough scholars to know that da, nobody knows. Okay. So, um, so yeah. So assuming a single author, so we're going to assume Lao Tse around it. So we're going to put that um, as our approach. We're going to assume Lao Tse wrote it. 
um, and we know we assume it. So it might not all fit together. But I'm going to tell you this, as somebody who loves classics, and I've got books on early Greek philosophy sitting in my office, along with I like this stuff. That's why I don't have any friends. <clears throat> okay, um, That's part of the fun of classics, is this unknown, is you don't know, and you're dealing with something that's fascinating. Um, because there's so many unknown elements to it. I'll, I'll tell you that. That's just as a personal side for me. That's part of the fun of it. It's part of what's cool about this old stuff. Okay, now let's jump in. Um, <clears throat> so blah, blah, blah. Oldest text, um, you know. So, yeah, I, I did this. So I already wrote that. Um, I'm going to call him liberal. Okay, and let's jump into it, into the text. Okay, that's the opening. You guys got this. That's from the Civil War or something like that. Um, the Spaniards always shooting each other. There's um, that's might be him, might not be him. That's a pretty cool picture of him. Um, let's get through this, okay? Let me jump up to. We're gonna get to about um, chapter eight. So stick with me for a bit. I know um, you're probably all really excited right now, but anyway, the tau that can be trodden. This this is the first sentence. It drives everybody's bonk. Everybody bonkers. The Tao that can be trodden is not the enduring and unchanging Tao. What the heck does that mean? That's not what it that the name that can be named is not the enduring and unchanging name. What's going on there? Let me go on a tangent for a little bit. It can't be named. He's not going to name it for you. Okay? This is called ambiguity. This is a very important concept. And something I don't want you guys to do is to get vague and fluffy and abstract because that's what too many Western people do when they run into Lao Tzu. Um, and he's known under the name of Lao Tzu or Lao Tzu. But if you punch him in on, in YouTube, you're going to get a lot of fluff. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, yeah, I punched it in under Lao Tzu. Um, and I got all these fluffy videos with these old guys with beards. What the heck? Um, he actually does mean something very precise. And this is the first term I want you to have down is ambiguity. This is something I mentioned last time. It does not define the Tao. Um, it leaves it present, but unclear. That's what it's supposed to be. If you think about terms like justice, um, you know, honesty, things like, what exactly is, what does it mean? There is a level of ambiguity, a level where it cannot be defined, okay? So he puts it there, and but he wants you to know there's a presence there, um, but he doesn't want to describe it because he'd just be making stuff up, okay? That's intentional. That's not bad writing. That's ambiguity. So one of the things I want to make very clear from the beginning, and a very common error, is to think that Lao Tzu is being fluffy and vague and abstract. He's not. He's introducing an element of ambiguity right from the beginning. That the Tao is going to be this sort of presence that's there that cannot be defined. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's like walking into a room where there's absolutely no light and then describing everything perfectly well. No, you're not. You're making stuff up and he is not going to make things up. One of the elements that you're going to need to have down is that you need to have some modesty, some intellectual and emotional modesty, and to respect things that are ambiguous, that are not clear. That's what he does right from the beginning, and it's magnificent. This Lao Tzu is perfectly well written. It's very good stuff. So. And then he has this little uh, segment in here. And you can kind of see what I'm talking about with they probably put these different texts together under the name of Lao Tzu. May maybe. I shouldn't even say probably. It's a big maybe. You have, it looks like an amalgamation of different texts. But these are what have been handed down as valuable under the name of Lao Tzu. Is it one author? Maybe. Is it two, three, no, 20? I don't know. But you get this idea, and it's going to work together ultimately. We're going to operate with the idea, because Westerners need it, of a single author. Okay, And then you have this passage right here on 3. Always without desire, we must be found. What the heck? Ah, that sounds like something you know Obi-Wan Kenobi would say. 
backwards. What, what the heck? Or I don't know. Um, yeah, but it's actually really clear. In other words, we should be found. Um, people should discover us without desire. That's what he's saying. In other words, don't have any desires. But that's really weird because we are constantly inculcated with this idea that we must have desires, wants, needs, and everything else. Um, we have to make progress and we've got, yeah, we've got to get things done. Um, he's saying the opposite. So you're going to be found, in other words, by other people, by other entities without desire. That's a good thing. Okay. If it's deep mystery, we would sound. In other words, if we would understand it um, and be close to it. So, but if desire always within us be, its outer fringe is all that we shall see. So we will only see this much if we have desire. We will only see the things we desire if, you know, that's all we see, okay? Um, if that's what we have. Our desires will create our vision. That's what they'll do. Our desires will create what we see. And that's really weird. That's not a vague, abstract concept. That's a very real concept. We're going to see what we want to see, what our desires tell us to see. Okay. Um, now watch this one. This is chapter two. So it is that existence and non-existence give birth the one to the idea of the other. Now, what the heck did he talk about there? This is based on this idea that he gave you in two and in, in one. I probably should have gone there. Um, if you see beauty and if you understand beauty, you say, wow, that is magnificent. That is beautiful. Constantly what will be present is the idea of what is not beautiful. The ugly will be present as an idea, present. You won't be fully aware, but it will be there. By knowing beauty, you are simultaneously recognizing what isn't beautiful. This is dichotomies. Things are built as oppositions to each other. And he says also in, in paragraph two to, to know skill to so you know if you see those you know those great videos where somebody does a dunk and somebody those dude perfect videos then you also immediately understand the fail videos when somebody blows it um, the skill that you see constantly reminds you whether or not you are fully aware of it of the lack of skill by knowing this you automatically know that it's a dichotomy okay. Do you want to understand white? Understand black. Do you want to understand white? Uh, black? Understand white. Um, understanding you constantly understand the world of what's in front of you by what is not there. You understand through dichotomy is what he views it as. This is a universal principle that runs deeper than something he can just observe and write down. This is something that rules the universe he sees. Um, this dichotomy. Okay. Um, and you can see this, if, and I, I hate to be, you know, um, I don't like to bring in a lot of contemporary stuff, but that thing I brought up on, on class the other day about China's going into Hong Kong, um, China's presence in Hong Kong is creating disorder. By trying to create order, they are making the disorder more apparent. That's the idea of Lao Tzu, okay? So he has ambiguity, that's the first concept I want you to have down, but he also has dichotomies. Things are in opposition constantly to each other. Okay. Therefore, the sage, man, the sage is whoever is the wise person, manages affairs without doing anything. If you want to control the city, don't control it because what you're going to do constantly by trying to control it, you're going to create disorder. That's what China's doing right now and finding out in Hong Kong. That's kind of what we found out with, you know, the Iraq war. It was already kind of had a lot of problems, but once we invaded, it actually created a lot more disorder. Um, these are principles that go on over and over and over again. Um, they're, you know, it's not just, you know, this place, that place. It constantly goes on. Once you try to assert order, you actually become aware of the disorder. Okay. Um, the sage manages affairs without trying to control everything and conveys his instructions without the use of speech. Then how does he or she do it? Um, the third term I want you to be aware of is to embody, is to embody it. Okay. So number one is ambiguity. Some things should not be defined if they cannot be. Okay. 
leave it abstract if it is abstract if that's the best you can do things certain things part of our worlds are abstract but that teaches you a modesty to not try to figure out things that you can't figure out it's acceptance of ambiguity okay then the next term is dichotomy that things are built on opposites and this is going to be a very important start to loud C is that dichotomy thing is when you push in one direction you're going to create the other and notice that is already present here you try to create order you're going to become aware of disorder okay so how do you create a more ordered society you don't assert order you embody it okay that's how you do it you behave that way that's how you do it that is inherently modest and accepting of what's going on in the world so be aware that this is this is why I get really bothered when people start doing all this abstract fluffy da that drives me bonkers because there are very precise concepts behind this um, and they're excellent the, this is sophisticated philosophy in Lao Tzu our Lao Tzu um, very sophisticated and I hope you can kind of see that coming out that this is running much more deeply than the, what strikes a lot of people as being fluffy on the surface but it's not fluffy under it <clears throat> okay um, I'm not gonna get too far maybe five I thought eight but I'm gonna get to five um, not to value and employ men of superior ability is the way to keep people from rivalry amongst themselves man you're like what the heck is this guy this guy's crazy you know if you're running a business you gotta hire the best people but notice what happens right when you hire the best people and this is the fourth concept you start creating a hierarchy of you're the top and then you hire the best people and you left the worst people out that is a social order what you just created by creating that hierarchy and these are things that are going to come up again and again and again in Plato and Wollstonecraft and Machiavelli once you create hierarchies you can in Lao Tse create desire amongst the people who were left out okay so you were the top you hired the best and guess what happened to these people they didn't just sit down and say oh I just didn't get picked this time I'm okay you know what they start desiring to be in that elite group you created a hierarchy and what you simultaneously created without intention was a desire of this group to have what that group had what you chose so he is not for hierarchies within society of course in our society today we have lots of hierarchies but notice what happens wherever they exist you have desire to disrupt that hierarchy whether or not it's I'm not going to get into whether or not one's justified and wanting to disrupt that they might or might not be but you have to recognize that by creating that hierarchy that's how that desire to disrupt that hierarchy was simultaneously created what Lao Tse, what his end game is, and I want to bring this up now because it's going to come up again and again and again. His end game is a more peaceful society where people get along and people are content and they accept where they are and they're totally cool. They don't go around stealing their neighbor's rake and start lighting things on fire and picking fights and smacking somebody in the head with a cue stick. They don't do that. Why? Because they've accepted things acceptance is extremely important okay that was one of the points from earlier on that you accept things the way they are you don't have a desire to change to control to disrupt um, to you don't envy things notice he's trying to put that in the leader so the leader doesn't infuse it into the people so that they once you create a higher hierarchy in the society you create the foundations of a disruptive society you know an unpeaceful one okay so the sage in the exercise of government empties their minds fills their bellies weakens their wills and strengthens their bones now most Americans would go that's bonkers man I you guys get down and do some push-ups okay we're gonna start class on Thursday with push-ups and jumping jacks no we're not <clears throat> what he's saying there is that by doing that he's going to as an end game you're going to create a more peaceful society okay um, that's what he's going after that's his end game is a more peaceful society is a better society okay 
Um, he constantly tries to keep them without knowledge and without desire. What does knowledge do? It makes you aware of the hierarchies that would create the desire to disrupt. Okay? What he wants you to do is to accept. Not to understand, but to accept. That's better. Okay? That's what he's trying to do. And this whole reading is very precise about this. And it's about emotional um, direction and everything else. And the end game is that it will create a more peaceful society. That's what he's after. Okay? Heaven and earth do not ask from or act from any wish to be benevolent, but deal with all things of the do, um, as the dogs of the grass are dealt with. The sages do not act from any wish to be benevolent; they deal with the people as the dogs of the grass are dealt with. So, in other words, they leave them alone. <clears throat> That's what they do. Um, notice this, this loud sea always drives everybody's bonkers. This is why I, I'd love to teach on Tuesday because I love watching everybody get bonkers. Um, Lao Tse is very, he, he definitely means this. The sage does not act out of good intentions in order to create the good, because you know what you're going to do is become aware of all the shortcomings and all the bad stuff that you got to take care of by trying to create a better society. You're going to become aware of all the cruddiness that's going on. So you're going to embody it and accept the world the way it is. Okay. That's what you're going to do. So having good intentions in order to do good things, I'm going to make this a better place. And again, notice how this goes against what we're taught. As we're brought, you've got to have good things and you've got to want to do. And no, you don't. <clears throat> According to Lao Tzu, you've got to learn to accept. And that's going to, that's, that's what he's talking about. That's the, the Tao, is this acceptance and embodying that. To embody it is the best approach not to try to change it to make it better because you're going to become aware of the problems. If you push in one direction, you become aware of the opposite. So accept the way the world is. Okay. So I'm going to stop there at five on chapter five. And so you get an idea of Lao Tse that keep going on Lao Tse and have him in good shape because we're going to go over him when I get back from all these doctor's appointments. So let me summarize a little bit. Um, of where we are. So Lao Tse, the big words are ambiguity and it's it's intentional. And part of the getting ambiguity is not trying to understand something you, you can't understand. It's not that you don't understand it, it's that you can't understand it. And ambiguity is the acceptance of that. Okay? You cannot know, understand the limits of understanding. This is the limits of your mind. Okay, he's doing something very sophisticated here that's difficult to understand. And it's acceptance of the situation. He goes a lot into, um, we, we use a lot of metaphors in such a way, you know, you got to be like a lion, be as smart as this. And we do a lot of living analogies. He uses a lot of analogies and, and metaphors for non-living things to be more like water. And water is one of the properties of it that physicists don't talk about very much are that it's accepting. It accepts the shape that it's placed within. It accepts the way it is. It accepts things. That's why he keeps talking about water, is he wants you to accept. Water accepts that it's falling down low, and that's the way it works. Okay? Um, that water analogy and those physical analogies are very important. And they don't have readily apparent intentions. They accept. Um, that's the analogies to physical elements, what he's doing with those, okay? Um, especially water, but with others. And he avoids hierarchies in society. Hierarchies are, I'm higher, you're medium, they're lower, and they're the lowest. No, we're not going to do that. We're all together. It's this avoidance of um, hierarchies in order to avoid conflict, okay? Um, now to set up a little bit with Plato, um, that I'm just getting through the part, the start of Lao Tse. I won't keep going because you guys are already sleeping on me. I'm going to set up Plato because I want you to read him. Okay, um, the reading you have from Plato, and let me go to it a little bit here if I can find it. Um, I don't have the rest of this to show you. Um, where's Plato? He's this marble-headed guy. That's a statue of him. That's apparently what he looked like. Okay. Plato's different than a lot of the other writers. We actually know who he was. Ah, what the heck? Yeah, this is was his book, and he wrote. This is one of his books. Um, he wrote. 
about this much. Ouch. This, I'll bring this to class when I'm back. Uh, that was all of his writing. This was one of his books, Republic. The reading you have is from the Republic. And we got his stuff. We knew who he was They because they copied it down over and over. And other people knew him, like Xenophon and all those other people I wrote on the board. Um, they knew him, okay? And the, yeah, <clears throat> everybody knew who he was. Um, he was an ugly guy. Um, apparently not as ugly as Socrates, though. Socrates was really ugly. Um, and you got the Benjamin Jowett translation, um, which is old. Um, <clears throat> So this is kind of weird, and I just want to give an introduction to this in case you go, you're you going to go over it fairly soon. I want to give a quick introduction, a little bit to know with this. This is a dialogue. He creates Socrates into a character of his dialogue, okay? So he was Greek from around 400 BCE-ish, a little bit around there. So he's a student of Socrates. He taught Aristotle. Um, he, is the, he is seen as his father of philosophy, and, and he is, okay? I, uh, don't tell me he wasn't. This, by the way, these are the pre-Socratics. These are the guys who were floating around before um, Plato. That's it. This, there's like 12 of these or 20 of them. Um, this is a collection of dozens of guys before him. This is, you know, Plato, he's it, okay? Um, he changed things. The Allegory of the Cave is a minor selection from this longer book that he wrote. Um, it's a small selection of it, but it's a, the most famous, okay? And he deals with the three levels of, of reality, or, or I shouldn't even say reality, of the three levels of how our mind works, okay? He talks about the level of the idea of the good or the ideal, and then he talks about the world of the real, in other words, you know, hard stuff around us, people with faces and things like words, I, I, da, <clears throat> the physical reality around us. And then he talks about the world of images when we <clears throat> have pictures of things. Um, for example, <clears throat> this is in reality a box, but it has an image of files on it. You know, that's, <clears throat> that's the real world. The, now you're looking at the image, <clears throat> okay? But it's still a physical, so... And the ideal world would be if somebody explained to you they wanted to produce those files and boxes and things like that. Um, <clears throat> those are the three levels of reality that are behind um, the allegory of the cave. So understand that. It's kind of weird. So Socrates did not write anything, but he is usually present in the dialogues that Plato wrote after it. If you wanted to write dialogues afterward you could write dialogues with people in them and you could place them in them. that's what Plato did Plato never sat down and said you know I think this this and this he didn't do that he wrote dialogues this is one big dialogue of people discussing things there at no point does he say I think this so that's what you're gonna get in Allegory of the Cave um, we're gonna I'll, I'll make the next video on Allegory of the Cave it'll be kind of fun um, so let's hold off there. Just read that over, read um, Lao Tse over, get it done, and then we'll jump into Plato. Okay, guys? Um, so Tuesday, we don't meet in class. Thursday, I will send out another video or I will send in a substitute. Okay? So Thursday is a maybe. Tuesday is a definitely not. I hope you guys have a good um, day on Tuesday and everybody's happy. All right? Take care, you guys.